You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, we have two publishing houses, RudolfSteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in London, which are the sole providers of English translations for us of uh, Rudolf Steiner's work and have also given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Reimagining Academic Studies. This is the seventh and last lecture, and then there's one more reading of a report that he gave later to people about this conference. Uh, It is translated by Judith Wormuth Atkinson, Collected Works, Volume 81. This is Lecture 7, entitled Anthroposophy and Theory of Language, given in Berlin on March 11, 1922. Most honored participants, the organizers of this course requested that every morning I introduce the observations of a particular day with some comments. Today I shall open our work with a somewhat aphoristic discussion. I realize that precisely today this is not going to be easy. In a brief course addressing the same issues we will be discussing today, which I held once in Stuttgart in front of a smaller audience. It became very clear to me that one needs a great deal of time to talk about the controversial things that we will be talking about today. Thus I would like to say in advance a few words about the spirit of contemplation required by anthroposophy with regard to the view of human language. When we speak of language and are planning to discuss language from a scientific point of view, we should realize that it is more difficult to look at language as an object of scientific study than to discuss nature outside the human being, or even the physical nature of the human. In those cases we have at least one object that is clearly defined for our perception. Of course we could still argue to what extent perception is the basis of the object, or to what extent the object is grasped through the cognitive human capacity simply as the effect of an unknown cause. These, however, are discussions that occur only on the intellectual level. The object of scientific observation is a given and completed thing. This is not at all the case with language. When it comes to language, part of what develops while we speak exists already in the unconscious life of the human psyche. Certain things surface from these unconscious areas and are then combined with conscious elements which move as waves over an unconscious or subconscious stream. The momentary content present in our consciousness while we are speaking is only part of the real object with which we are generally concerned regarding language. Even if we cannot change contemporary speaking habits, we can still find a way to bring language as an object into our consciousness during the process of speaking. I would like to give you a humble example to illustrate this. Around Christmas I gave a series of lectures on pedagogical and didactic topics in the Gertianum in Dornach. The occasion was the visit of a number of teachers from England who wanted to come particularly to hear these, this series of lectures. When the word was spread that this series of lectures would be held, people from other Western and Central European countries, for example Switzerland, decided to come to the lectures too. Since I could not give the lectures in the big hall of the Gertianum, which has more than 900 seats, but only in a small room, I had to give each lecture twice, one after the other. Already before the lectures started, I thought that I should separate the English speakers from the rest of the audience, certainly not, however, for any political reasons. I thought I should emphasize that the course was held in German, even for the English speakers, because I always speak in German when people want to hear something about anthroposophy, no matter where they are. I believe that this is a way to prove one's Germanness, and that this is in service to the German spirit and the German language. In one of those lectures I talked about ethics and moral education, and I tried to describe how children can be brought to a level of inner experience 
that allows them to form ethical and moral attitudes. If I were speaking today in front of people who listen in the same way as some people were listening yesterday, then the things that I am saying, out of having experienced them immediately, would be called artificially constructed, as it happened yesterday when I was speaking about the Trinity. Dr. Rittelmeyer, however, gave a very apt response to that, using the comparison of a head and a book, a response I did not want to give you for obvious reasons. I did not want to give for obvious reasons. In the lecture on education, in ethics, I wanted to show how we should guide children by awakening their feelings of gratitude, interest in the world, love for the world, and love for their own actions. I also wanted to show how the feelings that we perceive as duty develop out of this love for our own actions. Since we are talking about language today, I will mention that in relation to our immediate life, it was necessary to define a trinity with three words, gratitude, love, and duty. From the first two steps, gratitude and love, I came to the third, duty. I had to give this lecture twice, once from 10 to 11 o'clock for the English speakers and again from 11 to 12 o'clock for the listeners from other nations whose state of mind was essentially Central European. The second lecture could have been simply a repetition of the first, but in fact because I tried to put myself into the shoes of the listeners, I had to speak to the English in a very different way from the way I spoke to the Germans. Something similar happened on the other days, but it was particularly necessary on this day that I have mentioned. Why was this the case? While in the hour between 11 and 12 I was speaking about duty to people whose sensibility as listeners was built on the basis of the German language in the first hour between 10 and 11, I was speaking to people who perceived what I was telling them about the duty impulse against the background of their concept of, in quotes, duty. There is a big difference between the feeling one has when one says the word Pflicht and when one says the word duty. In the hour between 11 and 12, I had to let the nuance of our experience that results from the use of the word Pflicht flow into my lecture. In German, when we say the word Pflicht, we awaken an impulse that arises in our psyche and leads the experience immediately to something else, which I could express by the verb Pflegen, or to the outpouring of a feeling directed from the action itself to its object. This is the essence of the impulse defined by the word Pflicht. The psyche is a very different experience when we define this impulse using the word duty. Although the word Pflicht refers to the psyche, the word duty refers to the intellect, to the spirit, to a principle that guides us internally, as our thoughts guide us when we move to action. We could say that Pflicht is something we do out of inner love and devotion. In contrast, we fulfill our duty because if we have human dignity, we want to be able to follow a law that penetrates us we must be devoted to a law that we understand with the intellect. This, of course, is only an approximate description. My purpose is simply to emphasize that the complex inner experience is different depending on the use of different words, even though the dictionary tells us that the English word duty stands for the German word Pflicht. This fact applies to the entire national spirit to the soul of the nation. And you can see that language reflects the nuances of the soul of a people. You will see in that sense that the soul of the Central Europeans is very different from the soul of the people from other nations. And that psychic life is expressed in language by the Central Europeans in a way very different from that of the English. Those who have no sense for the fact that the unconscious elements integrated in language, are rooted on a much deeper level than the level of conscious experience, will find no clear object for the scientific investigation of language. 
We have to be aware that when we observe nature, the objects of observation are external, or we create them neatly by some external actions. In this process, the objects remain still outside ourselves. Thus, we can definitely observe them. When we observe language, first we have to go through a conscious process of figuring out what is the real object of study that we observe. Consequently, when it is about language, we should observe more than what is in our consciousness. When we observe language, we should keep in mind the whole living being that expresses itself in the process of speaking and in language. We are rarely prepared for this scientific observation of language. For example, if we study the history of language or comparative linguistics, to prepare ourselves properly for the observation of a particular language, we would need to contemplate first its object, that is, the, in quotes, object of each language is its inner unconscious content, the unconscious substance of what is only partly expressed in the conscious process of speech. In addition, at the different stages of human development, the degree of consciousness related to language was different. For example, it was one thing at the time when Sanskrit originated, another when ancient Greek was formed, and again it is something different here in Germany or in England, although the nuances here are becoming smaller and smaller and less visible. To mention only the rough distinctions, there are already major differences between the inner experience of a Briton and that of an American, both using the English language. Moreover, if one studies dialects, if, for example, one analyzes the different experiences people have when they use different German dialects, then one notices how many complicated psychic impulses flow into language expression and into the entire organism of language. It was a very good reason for why the Greeks felt essentially the same way when they spoke the word language and when they spoke the word reason, and why they combined these two concepts into one word. This was because the experience within the word and the experience within the thought, within the idea, were to a certain extent still indistinguishable and overlapping for the Greeks. While in our modern epoch there are distinctions in this respect. When ancient Greeks spoke, they felt that the thought was transformed into word. To them, the thought was the soul, and the word merely flowed into the thought like a body or shall we say, like the outer dress of the soul. Today, if we become conscious of this process, we may feel, when we pronounce a word on the one hand, as if the word floats away while we pronounce it, and on the other hand, as if the thought somehow swims on top of the stream of words. However, the thought is again clearly distinguishable from the stream of words. If we return now to Sanskrit, we will first need to go through some real psychological processes and experience certain soul phenomena to be in a position to internalize the feeling one must have had when saying a word at the time Sanskrit originated. We definitely should not look at Sanskrit with the same feelings towards speech and language with which we look at modern languages today. Let us take, for example, a very well-known word, manas. If you open the dictionary, you will find various translations of the word manas, spirit, reason, mind, and sometimes even anger or irritability. Generally, such translations do not bring us close to the inner feeling of the word that the people of ancient times once had and could experience so clearly. At the time when Sanskrit was a language fully alive, the state of the human soul was different from our soul state now. In fact, it, it was significantly different. It should be clear that as human beings have developed, there has been a deep transformation of the state of the soul. I have repeatedly characterized the major transformation that can be placed in the 15th century. However, as human development advances, there are always borderlines between the succeeding epochs. We can understand what was really happening at a particular time, 
and what the experience of language was part of, only if we can also analyze the inner psychological life of the human being at the time. At the time when the word manas was still perceived internally as something living, there was a phenomenon that I would like to call, quote, experience of the meaning of sounds, close quote. The inner experience was felt in an incredibly intense way through the sounds, which today we label as an M, an A, an N, and an S. When people pronounced vowels and consonants, the life of their soul was moving to a very high degree along with the processes within the organism, even if this was happening as if in a dream because they were aware of that dream. If we are equipped with this understanding, and if we analyze how language lives within us, we will realize that the use of consonants reflects the attempt of human beings, using their own inner but suppressed gestures, to immerse the self in external processes in the physical world, and to imitate the inner life of outer objects. Consonants are suppressed gestures, gestures that do not become visible, but that, nevertheless, include things we are able to experience in the rolling of the thunder, the flashing of the lightning, the blowing of the wind, and so forth. By experiencing consonants, we immerse ourselves in the external world. In fact, we want to repeat the life of external nature through gestures. We suppress the gesture, which transforms itself internally and appears in a metamorphosed form as a consonant. By contrast, we feel a certain amount of sympathy and antipathy when we are confronted with external nature. These sympathies and antipathies, which represent an inner experience, give birth to the entire, in quotes, vocalism or system of vowels. Thus, as we live in language, we create a metamorphosed imitation of the external world through the use of consonants, but express our own inner relationship to the external world through the use of vowels. If we look in detail at the concrete language experience, we could certainly grasp and understand this even with the kind of life the psyche has today. When I use the word, in quotes, imagination, I do not mean some kind of fantasy but the fact that the inner process of language experience could be really seen in ancient times. When the Sanskrit language originated, a dreamlike imagination was still alive in the human soul. At that time, people did not have images with sharp contours as we do today. They saw life in pictures, in images. However, these were not images like the ones discussed in Anthroposophy today, Images of which we are fully aware, images that are similar to our concepts with sharp contours. Instead, they were dreamlike, instinctive images that nevertheless had the effect of driving forces. One could say those images lived in the human being as living forces. People felt those forces as they felt hunger or thirst, but in a somewhat quieter way, so to speak. In their minds, people were painting pictures, in a way. Of course, this is not the same way we paint pictures today. This kind of painting, however, was actualized in the use of vowels, applied as if they were paints applied to a canvas. Using vowels, people were immersing themselves in the element of the consonants, as if they were using the colors to highlight borderlines and contours. This was an inner experience that reproduced an experience of the imagination. At the same time, the experience represented an objective reproduction of external nature. It was an experience of the dreamlike imagination. People yielded to the images that worked internally in their organisms and through the organs of speech dressed the images in words. This is the only way we can imagine the inner process of the language experience in the early stages of human development. If we experience with this observation and take it further, using, for example, the experience of the sound that we call M today, we realize that in an earlier time, 
the sound was at the borderline between consonant and vowel. The pronunciation of the word manas could be compared to the way we would paint a picture today without applying surface colors that would highlight the outer borderlines of the inner distinctions. On the other hand, when the sound ah was pronounced, people felt something like the inner world of the human being. And if I want to describe the entire word manas in this way, then I would have to say that in those ancient times, language gave life to people's dreamlike images as our consciousness today gives life to language. As for language now, we do not live in dreamlike imaginations any longer. Our consciousness goes beyond the use of language. But for Sanskrit speakers in the past, the old dreamlike images kept flowing into language. Those who pronounced the word manas felt as if they were in a shell. They felt as if the physical body, consisting of water and other liquids, was some kind of a shell, and as if the other body was carried by a vessel of air. When people of ancient times pronounced the word manas, they experienced all this as in a dream. In their souls they did not feel the same way as we do today. They felt themselves to be vessels of the soul life. The soul was experienced as something given by the supra-terrestrial and supra-human forces of the shell. If we want to grasp the old content of a word, we should first awaken this experience. We should also know that today when we feel the self our inner psychic experience is very different from the experience that people in earlier times had when they said the word ego or from what people in earlier times experienced when they pronounced the Sanskrit word aham. Today we experience the self as something that has shrunk to a, into a single point, a point that we regard as the center of our inner being and all of our soul forces. This feeling was not the basis of the concept of the self revealed to the people of ancient times. In those ancient days, the self was still felt as something that we carried, not as something that we were inside of. In a way, the self was perceived as something independent that swims on the waves of the psychic life. However, nothing in the composition of sounds suggested such perception. Thus, the content of the Sanskrit word aham is something surrounding the self or something that carries the self. In our time, we experience the self as an inner impulse of the will, which seems to penetrate our inner being as the center of a heat source irradiating heat rays in all possible directions, to use a comparison. In contrast to the ancient Greek and even to the Roman later, the self was something like a ball of water, and this ball seemed to be completely filled with air. To state the analogy precisely, it is one thing to experience the air expanding in the ball of water, and another to experience the internal radiation of a heat source that spreads warmth in all directions, but must be perceived as a ball filled with air. These, of course, are all symbols. However, the words in any given language are symbols too, and those who argue that words cannot be defined as symbols would not be able to participate in such observations. Therefore, if we want to discuss language, first we should be able to understand the essence of the object of linguistics. Then we would realize that in ancient times the character of language was very different from the character language has in modern civilizations. We would also realize that in the past the physical bodily element played a more major role in the producing of sounds and in the configuring of words. People invested language with their inner life much more than they do now. This is why they had the M in the beginning of the word manas, because it included the idea of the human and gave it contours. When we look at Sanskrit expressions, we soon notice that they represent the experience of both cons consonantal and vocal elements. We notice that there is some inner immersion in the external processes and the physicality of the external world. 
We realize that the formation of words and the entire process of speech are the result of imitation in the consonants and the feelings of sympathy and antipathies in the vowels. There was a much more physical nuance to the way all this came to be in ancient times. An ancient language was experienced more fully. We still could have a similar experience today. If you listen to people who speak Sanskrit or any other language of the Eastern civilizations, you can hear how the sounds they produce reflect their entire being, including their physical bodies, and other speech as the characteristic of music. It comes from the same kind of an inner experience as music, only at a much later stage of human development was music separated from logic or from the soul that lived in simple images. We could notice this today too. If we compare the inner experience of the German language to that of English, we would realize that in English the process of living within the framework of abstract ideas is more advanced. If we want to live in the German language, we have to immerse ourselves in those forms that emerged with New High German. Dialects allow our psyche to dive into even more intense, more vigorous experience. The real spiritual experience of the German language becomes possible only at the stage of High German. This is why someone like Hegel was formed under such conditions. He was a person formed entirely by the belief that the idea is something independent, in itself. Yet it is experienced exclusively through a particular element of language. For that reason it is possible to translate Hegel into another of the Western languages, for in his works we still experience language in an immediate way. In the West you will notice everywhere in people's experience that the psyche unfolds when it is devoted to the use of language. The psyche is capable of intense experience, but everywhere language is being thrown out of the immediate experience of the psyche. In English, for example, the stream of speech flows and flows, and out of the flowing water people constantly build something like sheets of ice that swim on top of the waves as firm meanings. When we speak High German, we realize that in the stream of speech there is something liquid, and that, in contrast to English, in the stream no ice flows have formed to fall out of the language. This contrast is a phenomenon connected to the human soul and the human spirit. In the East you will find the same process at an even earlier stage of development. There you will not see ice flows being thrown out of the stream of language, Neither will you experience the complete overlap between thought and word, as in High German. Instead, you will find that the word is experienced in a way that keeps it in the organism, although the thought is something that escapes the word, something that we have to run after or that moves ahead of us. If we want to understand language, these are the things we need to become aware of. We cannot deal with them if we do not accept, at least to a certain degree, Goethe's phenomenological approach to observation, which he established in relation which he established in, in relation to the living world of plants. When we follow it consistently in our inner experience and in our inner practice, such an approach leads to the development of imaginative abilities mentioned in anthroposophy. Those who want to analyze language should generally approach it in a way that allows them to experience the inner metamorphosis of its organization in a concrete way. Only then can we see the real language process. As long as we are not able to lift ourselves to the level of such language analysis, we will be looking at language only from an external point of view, and we will not be able to make any progress to the discovery of its real object. This is why in our present culture there are so many different theories of language. Thinking about language has become, in many respects, thinking about the origins of language. And there are a number of theories established with regard to this question. Wilhelm Bundt lists them in his title Theory of Language and takes them apart in his criticism. 
we see the same happening in many other areas. And we saw the same thing here yesterday as well. When the supporters of a particular school of thought in modern science begin to contemplate and analyze the facts offered by the science they represent, they begin to speak of a, in quotes, downfall. This is certainly not what anthroposophy wants to tell you. Yesterday, for example, almost nothing was mentioned about a downfall from the perspective of anthroposophy. Those who discussed theology, however, spoke a good deal about a downfall. When people philosophize about language, we also hear of the downfall of theories, such as the theory of invention. Wundt lists and discusses various theories. According to the theory of invention, language was established or invented as people gave things certain definitions. Today, according to Wundt, this explanation no longer sounds plausible. How would deaf-mute people have determined forms of language, even very primitive forms? As second choice, Wundt mentions the miracle theory. According to this theory, at a particular stage of human development, the Creator gave language to the human being as a gift. As Dr. Geyer mentioned yesterday, no scientist the least bit respectable is allowed to believe in miracles today. This is forbidden, thus the miracle theory is no longer acceptable. Next on this list is the theory of imitation, which contains some plausible elements, since it says that the consonant element of language is based on a process that is much more internal than the one we usually imagine. Next, Wundt mentions the theory of natural sounds. This theory implies that what humans attempted to find in language on the basis of their inner experience was the overlap between the sound of the words and the perceptions of external nature, accompanied by sympathies and antipathies. All these theories could be formulated in a different way, too. Currently, simply on the grounds proposed by those who have criticized those theories, it is possible to show that none of them can grasp the real object of language. As a matter of fact, although people say that they do not need to turn to anthroposophy, it can demonstrate that it offers certain productive thoughts that could help science find the purest, most clear objects of observation, even in an area such as the theory of language. We can certainly discuss many things, including language, even if we do not yet see language as a pure object of contemplation. Anthroposophy, however, has a profoundly scientific character, and it aims, first of all, at the clarification of the question, what kind of reality can we find in a particular scientific field to experience within ourselves the connection between the things we perceive as truth or knowledge in a field and a specific kind of reality? Some people say about our work, which is not any easier than the work in any other branch of science, that anthroposophy, quote, sticks its nose in everything, close quote, as was mentioned here yesterday. We will have to give the following response. It certainly turned out that in the process of its development, anthroposophy had to stick its nose in everything. But if we do not want this superficial perception, that anthroposophy sticks its nose in everything, to leave a permanent mark, Rather, we should move on and pay attention to and study the questions that arise when anthroposophy investigates things seriously. Then and only then, when we come to this second stage of our relationship to anthroposophy, will we be able to fertilize, excuse me, will we be able to realize how fertile anthroposophy is and to what extent it is vindicated when confronted with the kind of judgment just mentioned, which appears to be only a superficial observation. That is the end of Lecture 7, the end of the seven lectures, and the next thing after this will be a, a report that was given by Steiner later on.